some friends of mine in Italy uh, in the context of our discussions about Islam in Europe uh, began referring me regularly to certain articles uh, that had been published in Asia News. Um, and among all the things I read, these articles from Asia News kept striking me as something that, uh, as statements that were refreshing for their clarity, for their honesty, uh, for their sympathy as well, uh, the non-ideological way in which very complicated, difficult, and sensitive questions were being faced. Well, I didn't know at the time uh, who Father Samir was, but it turns out in retrospect, of course, that was the voice that, for me, uh, was uh, a, a model of this kind of openness uh, and sincerity in this difficult discussion uh, that uh, I, I learned to read and respect and learn a great deal from. So it's a particular honor for me to be able to introduce you today. Father Samir is a member of the Society of Jesus. He uh, was um, uh, educated in philosophy and theology and Islamic studies. Uh, he worked for a number of years at the Papal Oriental Institute in Rome. I think you still do, uh, but were the, there full time. Uh, but is not only a scholar, has also served to establish schools, for example, in various countries, in Egypt and, and elsewhere. Um, he moved in 1986 to Lebanon. Now the date is significant. It's the middle of the civil war in Lebanon, of course. And yet Father Samir uh, moved there uh, to begin teaching at the University of St. Joseph, where he still is today, where he teaches Catholic theology as well as Islamic studies, and most notably the relationship between those two, between Christianity and Islam, uh, both in the Middle East and in Europe. Aside from the university, he founded a research institute that's devoted to uh, collecting and preserving the Christian heritage of the Near East, uh, Sejak. I'm not even sure what it stands for. Uh, the, the, um, and uh, perhaps he is uh, one of the only people, one the only person, I don't know, in the world who on a regular basis uh, serves both to teach Christianity to Imams and also to teach about Islam to figures within the church, uh, not only at the university, but throughout Europe, well, political leaders as well as ecclesiastical figures. He's been a visiting professor and lecturer at any number of uh, distinguished universities throughout the world, and so uh, for him to come so far to northern Indiana to be with us on uh, an incipient winter day in South Bend is, uh, is particularly something that we're very grateful for. Uh, so please join me in, in welcoming Father Samir. I had also the privilege two years ago to be here in Notre Dame, invited by Professor Reynolds on the Quran. And we had a very interesting discussion with uh, some young Muslims. The, the title, the title proposed, I proposed it. Uh, Benedict XVI's Regensburg Address, a project of the universal dialogue of cultures, especially with Islam. So I will try to, to analyze not too long the, the speech itself of Regensburg, but the main point will be to study the part dealing with Islam, putting it in its larger context. Just to be clear, oh, wait a minute, I forgot something. Uh, just to be clear, this page, it's one page. After the introduction, we have less than one page dealing with Islam. And then, proportionally, something like six, seven pages dealing with the West, and then one long page of conclusion. 
And I will move at the end to the conclusion, which is the most important part of this um, address. Uh, first, I have some, um, some questions to clarify who was speaking and to whom. Uh, who was speaking, it's a strange question. Uh, I'm asking myself, was it a speech of uh, Pope Benedict? I'm not sure. Analyzing the text, it is very clear that the one who spoke was Professor Ratzinger. And it's an important distinction. And there are, it's not an impression. One can prove this through his text and analyzing the style used by popes and by himself as a pope and analyzing the style of this address. Um, it's an important question, even if at the end I will ask myself, was it right to speak as professor? Uh, it was clear for him. This travel in Bavaria was um, a travel in his own region, land in Deutschland. Uh, and especially Regensburg, he taught there. And I had the privilege at that time, it was the beginning, uh, I want to study German. So I went to Regensburg and I couldn't attend any lecture for German. So I went to his seminar at least to catch something. And it was my first contact with him uh, anonymously. He didn't know that. He was teaching there for a long time. If we read the text, there are so many private records uh, in his life as student, as young priest, as bishop, as, as author, as the one who discussed with uh, Habermas, uh, with uh, others, um, a lot of private records. It was very close to his village, a few, a few miles. In his university, and he, he says in his title, the title of his address is Faith, Reason, and the University records um, some records from my youth or something like that. The question one could ask, uh, he has the right to speak as a person? He is the Pope. The question is valid. But the answer is also valid. I think every person has the right to be himself. Not always a president is not necessarily always uh, doing, dealing as president. In his last book on Jesus Christ, he says clearly in his introduction, uh, I am speaking as a personal Christian, as a believer. This distinction in the Catholic tradition is very important. We, we always distinguish between um, a, a dogma and when the Pope enunciates a dogma and we give some conditions. When he speaks ex cathedra and when he, and he intend to pronounce a dogmatic affirmation. And there are different conditions. That means we distinguish clearly, even within his function of pope, between the normal magisterium of the pope and the dogmatic affirmation. Uh, all these distinctions it's impor are important to uh, to evaluate this speech. 
Now, certainly, I think one could also say maybe it would have been better not to speak as private. I think he didn't uh, realize that whatever a pope says will be immediately presented as the Catholic Church asserts that, and so on. He is probably more cautious now. Um, and uh, another thing which he, at that time, I hope he realized now, is that um, being such an, a difficult intellectual to follow, he was speaking for the professors in his university. But he was, uh, those who spoke about the speech was not the professors, were journalists. They have another approach. They want to, to say something provoking. This is their job. Even if one could ask if their Deontology, I don't know if the word is English, yeah, uh, was right. Because there, are, for me, a journalist, someone in the media, has as a first task to inform and then to comment. The information was absolutely wrong. They didn't inform about these seven pages. They picked some sentences, provocative, out of their context. But from the other side, it would have been more reasonable for the Vatican to prepare a page for the poor people we are, how to understand what he is saying. Hmm? He didn't. It, I hope they, they will do it the next times. So this was some previous remarks. Now, uh, the, what happens with the text itself? Yeah. What are the main critique from the Islamic side? First of all, the quotation of Manuel uh, Paleolog, uh, written around the year thir uh, 1397, I think, uh, short, shortly before the, uh, the f fall down of Constantinople. Uh, it's a discussion written in Greek by himself, the emperor, who was also a philosopher, with a discussion, most probably a, a real discussion he had, being a prisoner, with a, a teacher, a Persian teacher, Mudarris, a scholar, let us say. Uh, this discussion, why he used it? Uh, the, the, the question everyone is asking is, couldn't he not find something else? I think no. He found this text, and he was right in founding it. What is the main, the, the main sentence found in this speech? There is only one sentence repeated five times, five times. And the sentence says, I'm going to the English. Uh, it was not to act in accordance with reason is contrary to God's nature. This is the only sentence repeated many times 
even five times in these seven pages or eight pages. That means when I make a an, an literary analysis that this is the core of his speech, not to act in accordance with logos, sun, with reason, is contrary to God's nature. From this, the consequence is um, why he'd have chosen this one? Because we have God's nature, reason, and action. His speech is on faith and reason, faith in God and reason. And he will always use it um, to say it is unreasonable. It, it, you cannot say, I am acting against reason because of God, because of my religion. Uh, beneath this, the question is, you cannot say, I am using violence in God's name, because violence is against the reason and against God's nature. So, to defend God as all religions sometimes or often pretend to defend God's or God's rights by using violence is against God himself. This sentence was not the big point. And, but it makes the link between the two. The other sentence before um, was the, the question of uh, violence. In the discussion, the emperor says to, to the scholar, the Muslim scholar, what have you, what did you bring, what, your, what did your prophet bring you? Uh, only the right to use violence to propagate your faith. And this was very hurting. Now, if we go to the, to the dialogue, the seventh dialogue, there is a context. Clearly, one who reads the text understands that this text is not thought in Greek, this part of the text, but in Arabic. And there is one proof for that. I ask you, in English, what does it mean that the emperor is speaking of the three laws? Twice, the three laws. What does it mean? Which laws? There is no commentary, no explanation. The three laws in the Muslim Christian discussion in Arabic is very obvious. The three revealed laws. We, we say in Arabic, to speak of the religion, we say Sharia, which means the law supposedly revealed. And when we say the three, this is a typical Islamic expression. I personally reject it when when I have time, when we have friendship and we can start to discuss. Uh, because I say, why you say three? Muslims, in their apologetical thinking, always say, there are only three religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I say, what? What to do with Buddhism, Hinduism? This is not religions. This had nothing to do. There are only three. And even one of the greatest thinkers, um, Qadi Abdul Jabbar, a Mu'tazilit, a rationalist, as we pretend, um, when he starts to, 
um, uh, before criticizing or attacking Christianity, he says, first of all, let us have a look to the religions. There are three religions. And he starts. It's never um, um, a sociological approach. It's always a religious theological approach. Sociologically, there are a lot of religions. But our thinkers in the Middle Ages as today will usually speak theologically. So they speak of the three laws that mean the three revealed religions because Muslims pretend that they are only three. And we don't agree with them. But this is their vision. So hearing the three laws, any scholar understands that he is speaking using the Muslim language. Why? Because this is what the, the Mudarris said. Now what he said? He said there are three religions, revelations, sharia, sharia. The first one is that of Moses. This is a rather grob. Uh, it's an imperfect religion, very, uh, very um, uh, underground, so uh, not, uh, not heavenly, very earthly. He used the word earthly. Uh, and um, very primitive religion. That's why God sent Jesus to to perfect it. Jesus came with a new law, the law of the gospel, which is so ideal, so heavenly, so spiritual, that in fact nobody could follow it. Plus, says the, the, the Persian scholar, this law is unreasonable. Why? Because uh, it's obliged to love your enemy, and this is against the reason. You cannot love. You have to, to aggress, your, to respond to your enemy. So it's, um, it's not practicable, and it's unreasonable. That's why God sent Muhammad with the third and last law, which took the, be the best of the first one, the best of the second one, and proposed a middle way, din al-wasat, as we used to say in Arabic, the religion of the middle. And as everyone knows, in medio stat virtus. As uh, uh, Aristotle says that the, the, the most reasonable way is the way of the middle. So is Islam the best because it has something earthly, something spiritual and uh, uh, heavenly. I'm using his terms. But it's reasonable. Everyone could do it. Furthermore, it's a natural religion. Din al fitra the religion of the created nature as God created the first day of the creation. The proof is that even Adam was a Muslim. You know that in the Quran. Adam and everyone was Muslim. Abraham, Noe, Abraham, and so on. With Abraham, he's right. He's saying, the Quran is saying, Abraham was not a Jew, which is true. Abraham was not a Christian, which is true. Abraham was Hanif, which is in Syriac, true. Because Syriac, Hanif means, Hanpo means a pagan. But in the Quranic language, Hanif turned to be a true Muslim because of the opposition. He was a Hanif Muslim. 
So everyone is Muslim because Islam is the true natural religion. This again, I agree. If I take Islam in the etymological sense, uh, we have this beautiful sentence in the Quran, inna deen indallah al-Islam. The religion, uh, the true religion, uh, uh, the true religion is Islam. But if you analyze the word deen, which is not Arabic, in all Semitic languages, deen is a root meaning judge. Hmm? Um, it's a Persian uh, importation. Hmm? So deen means the deepest identity. So the true, the true religious act is Islam. Islam means to submit to. Here is to submit to God. The true religious attitude is to adore God and so on. In that sense, this sentence is beautiful. And this is the true sense of the verse because it's one of the sentences taken from the first part, the Meccan uh, part, when Muhammad was, um, was supported, asking the support of the Christians uh, in Mecca. It couldn't be against. And because Islam as a system was not yet established. So the, the Persian scholar says, there is the first law, bad, not perfect. The second law, too spiritual. And the, the third and last law, which is the most reasonable, and so on, which took the best of both. And then comes the answer. If it's so, so what did you bring, uh, brought new? What your prophet brought to the world, which was not already in the two previous. Yes, the only thing he brought, and here he is not right, is the permission to act with violence to propagate Islam. Now, the fact that Islam propagate uh, with wars is undiscussable, even if you will always hear in the modern West and, and in our apologetical discourse in, in Islam, you will always hear that's not true, uh, violence is not um, in the Quran and so on. Violence is in the Bible at each page, in the Hebrew Bible, and is also in the Quranic text. And uh, the obligation to fight the enemies of God and his prophet, and this and his prophet is for me one of the most uh, problematic expression. The permission to fight, the, uh, it's an obligation. There is one category in the Quran of, of Muslims who are the worst, and those are the munafiqun. The munafiqun, that means the hypocrites, hypocrites? <laughs> hypocrites. Hmm? The hypocrites. Why? It's said, it's written clearly. Because they pretend to be Muslims, but when we have to make uh, war, against the enemies of God, then they retire and they sit, says the text. So the, the obligation of fighting is already in the Quran. We've, you find it much more in the Sunnah, in the Hadith, in the tradition of uh, Muhammad, you have usually a chapter 
in all the six big official uh, gathering of the of the hadith hmm? you have always a chapter on jihad and if you read it it does not correspond to what people in the west say i heard it this morning even um, that it's not speaking about what you would call the 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 big jihad or the small jihad they don't speak about that they speak about jihad in the meaning of qital which is clear which means fighting until the other die or i die hmm? but there is a theory now everywhere you hear that uh, it's nice huh? if there is the small jihad and the big jihad you find this hadith also but it's very rare hmm? uh, saying the the true jihad is the the internal mystical jihad. It's also true, but it's not the common sense in the first in the in the traditional Islam. Uh, by the way, we call in Arabic those who fight mujahidun, and we don't call the mystics mujahidun, but the, those who fight. The fact of the the spread of Islam first in Arabia during the time of Muhammad himself is not only uh, undiscussed, but we are proud of it. In our schools, I myself learned the Ghazawat al-Nabi, how the Prophet uh, did his um, uh, Ghazwa, Ratsia, uh, how you call the, this his reds uh, against uh, against the different tribes and how he finally came out gathering he he realized something which was never realized previously in that sense he was really um, the the one who who completed the dream of the arabs he gathered almost all the tribes around the idea of God. But there is something interesting, that when he died, some tribes uh, draw, uh, went behind, uh, uh, retired. Hmm? Um, and they said, well, we, we, make, we make a pact with uh, Muhammad. He's no more there. Now, the pact is, um, is no more in act. And they, they call that irtadda. He, he went back. And the first caliph, Abu Bakr the pious, said, no, you can't. And he fought them. His companions were not dis disagreed with him in the beginning that this is not the meaning of the prophet. Let them, uh, the, the, no, no, no constriction in matter of religion, la ikraf din But he did. He fought them, and they came all back. And so the companions said, okay, it's good. It's good. Huh? This is... Uh, Menschlich, uh, it's a, a human. Um, and they started progressing, Abu Bakr, and, and uh, <coughs> they conquered the Middle East in less than 10 years. So the fact itself is not discussed. In our Arabic tradition, even Christian, um, discussing with Muslim will never um, attack them because of the jihad. It was thought as a normal thing. It's the, the, the emperor who reason, uh, thinking maybe because he was in prison. This is another psychological question. But the fact is that in his Hellenistic thinking, 
This was unthinkable. Uh, quoting this sentence, the Pope, or Ratzinger, as I said, uh, is very cautious. Before quoting it, he says, um, I, I read, <clears throat> he addresses, now he is speaking, uh, he, that's the emperor, addresses his interlocutor with a startling brusqueness, a brusqueness that we find unacceptable on the central question about the relationship between religion and violence in general. These are the words of Ratzinger, saying, show me just what Muhammad brought uh, that was new. And there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Uh, we have a famous hadith uh, saying that I was uh, sent by God to fight those who, uh, who does not believe in God and in Islam. Ratzinger is commenting, the emperor, after having expressed himself so forcefully, goes on to explain in detail the reason why spreading the faith through violence is something unreasonable. Violence is incompatible with the nature of God and the nature of the soul. He's quoting again, uh, the emperor. So uh, coming to this sentence, he himself before and after say it's unacceptable. But he's quoting because it, it, uh, it clarify something very important. Now what's the, uh, how many time we, we, we have still? No, no. 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes, okay. Uh, the, the speech is directed to the Western, to the German, in fact, first of all. And the speech is to say, um, we in the West, or you, uh, bought a system based on the reason. And this is correct. But after the uh, enlightenment, you in, and we have to accept enlightenment even if it's very provocative for us Christians and so on. He's always repeating that enlightenment is a central point in the, the history of the West and of Christians. And that uh, to, to think that we have to go back previous to, to before the Enlightenment is wrong. This is clear in all his speeches. Uh, even uh, he, he, make, um, he reassumed his travels a year after, um, after a year of being Pope, he presented to the Cardinals the 22nd of December 2006, uh, the last year, analyzing every, every step he did and he reassumed uh, his Regensburg uh, speech, uh, uh, pointing to, to this question, um, enlightenment is something essential for the, the Catholic and the Christian faith. So his critique is not against the enlightenment. His critique is against what people in the last two centuries, the Western, did with the reason. They emptied the reason for, from its spiritual and ethical um, contents. This is his main critique and the reason why he spoke of the reason and Hellenism. And then the three, he is developing the idea of three steps in the and Hellenisierung, the, in, in the uh, dis, diesel Hellenize uh, the culture. And, and here, 
I don't, I'm not a specialist. Hmm? He has his opinion. Uh, according to him, is starting with Luther, the first step, and then uh, he, he developed three steps in this uh, movement to empty the reason from its uh, Hellenistic and, and Christian dimension. Uh, this point, that the reason Logos is not for him simply a philosophical question, but absolutely theological and rooted in the New Testament, he uh, is shown by his commentary of the first verse of John, hmm, uh, that God is reason and reasonable, the, uh, God be, uh, is the Logos, and the Logos was God. Hmm? That through Christ, <clears throat> the, the meaning of God is revealed in, in John, uh, that he is the reasonable, and the reason itself. This clearly, we've, we will find that in the Arab Christian theology. This is, by the way, I'm not teaching Catholic theology. It could be Catholic, I hope. Uh, but I'm teaching Arab Christian hmm, theology, uh, discovering the text. The, uh, the way the, the greatest philosophers used to explain the Trinity is to say God is the akl, the, the nous in Greek, the, the mens, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and the the Akl um, is certainly, I, I, I will use the, the words, the Latin words. In, the, in, intelligence is intellecting, must intellect. What can God intellect? He intellects himself because he is before, let us say chronologically, which is a nonsense. Huh? Uh, th there is no word. So, the intellect, God as intellect, is intellecting himself and is the object of the intellection. So God is intellect, intelligence, and intellectum. So is one of the most famous presentation uh, of the Trinity in the Arab Christian tradition done by Yahya ibn Adi and his successor and used even by Ghazali, the greatest theologian in the 11th century, the Muslim theologian, and by Maimonides in the same time in, uh, well, and the 12th, uh, 12th century. Hmm? In, in chapter 71 of his first part of the uh, Dalalit al-Ha'irin, the guide of the Perplexed, hmm? he is quoting this sentence. Hmm? Uh, this, the, the idea that God is reason and reasonable and is fundamental in Greek thought and Greek thought passed to the Arabs, uh, Christians or Muslims or Jews. And hmm? this is our tradition. In the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th century, the uh, this Greek philosophy is our philosophy. And when we speak of the greatness of, the, of Islam, it's true. And uh, the fact that it's borrowed uh, in, in the Hellenistic does not uh, minimize the, great, the greatness of this thinking. The problem is that we today, since the many centuries, difficult to say exactly when, but slowly since the 12th century until the 19th century, we, we took our distance, we distanciate ourselves from uh, this Hellenistic thinking. And the same thing happened after the, Il the Enlightenment, because I think there is one reason. Our Enlightenment, we did it. 
eight centuries before the West. In, in, the, ninth, ten, in the 10th century, let us say. Um, I don't know if I have the time to read. I just uh, uh, say it in my words. Um, someone from Andalusia, a judge, came to make a visit to the, the East. And he went through Baghdad. And then came back through Fez and then to Andalusia. And when he was in Fez, Fez was the capital of the, uh, it was not Rabat, uh, this is from the French, uh, but Fez. Uh, and one of the judges there uh, said, uh, what about your travel and how it was? Uh, have you been in Baghdad? Yes, certainly. Have you attended this famous Majalis? Majalis, this was discussions, uh, um, the, the caliph or a minister or a vizier or, used to gather uh, all the, uh, the, the, the responsibles of all the communities. The Muslim groups, the um, hereticals and so on, as they used to speak, Christians, Jews, Mazdian, and the materialists, and uh, uh, they, they use names for tens of groups. Yes, I intend. And uh, how was it? Oh, don't speak about that. I can not even record what I, I, uh, I have seen there. What happened? He says, look, we were there. And then each time when someone, a Christian came, or a Jew, or a Mazdian, everyone stood up. What a shame for Islam. Commentary yeah, for him. And then... When everyone was here, <clears throat> the, the minister said, now let us start our meeting. And one of these non-believers uh, came and said, I remind you the rule. Nobody is allowed to use his scripture because you know that we don't believe in it. Nobody is allowed to quote his prophet, because we don't believe in your prophet. The only basis for our discussion is the reason, al-aql. And everyone applauded. And the comment of the Farsi was, what a shame for Islam. This was the atmosphere. This was our enlightenment. We, we could not support it. After two centuries, again, the, the, not, uh, uh, again, the religious uh, tendency took over. Now, in the West, it's the opposite. It's not the religious tendency. It's the irreligious. So we have, we arrived to today. Well, his purpose is for today. He's not making a speech um, uh, uh, historical speech. He's using history and philosophy and theology and, and Bible and so on. Um, his uh, idea is in the West, the relation between faith and reason is uh, destroyed because reason is emptied from uh, any spiritual. In the Muslim world, is the contrary. The faith is emptied from reason. So here we have violence, here we have atheism, secularization, and there is no, no contact possible. Because the last page is the most important one. He, he is saying, he is trying to, to give the, the fundaments, the basis, often um, of a universal dialogue of cultures and religions. For that, we need a basis. The basis is reason and spirituality, or faith. If one of both is lacking, then there is no more. And this is, he says, this is the reason why the Western culture is now unable to have a dialogue 
with Islam and with other cultures. And it's clear that his aim is this dialogue. Uh, th there is now one point I didn't mention because I forgot it, but which is important, and he was criticized for that point. He said, he quote once the Quran, only once. And the verse is the famous verse from uh, the Al-Baqarah, the chapter two of the Quran, la ikrafidin, no constrictions, constriction in matter of religion. Until here, nobody reacted. But then he added something, or before quoting it, he said, when he was weak and without uh, support, he said, no constriction in religion. And at that point, every Orientalist said, what a shame. It's well known that is from Medina period. But let us look more precisely. According to all the Muslim tradition, printed in the Saudi Arabia official um, Quran. It is said, this Surat al-Baqarah, the, the cow, hmm, is said to be revealed in the first one revealed in Medina, with some verses revealed in, in the travel, in the Hijra, between Mecca and Medina. So this chapter is in fact when he was totally uh, weak and without any support even if it was uh, at the very beginning because uh, before the second year of the hijra he had absolutely no support the two the two arab tribes his support he thought would be the jews but we know what happened. They didn't support him. And then came the massacre of the three Jewish tribes and to take their um, oasis and so on. Hmm? So this is true. But there is something uh, I read from my colleagues, uh, even Jesuit colleagues, two of them, who wrote, yes, the pope uh, had not to say something like that. and and to say when he was, and, and to make the contextualize the Quran. But this is typical from Ratzinger. He's contextualizing the Bible every time he quotes it, even if he, in his speech, uh, quoting the, um, uh, how we say, um, the Buisson Ardent, when uh, Moses Exodus 3, burning bush. Burning bush. He is making a contextualization and saying, and that's why after, uh, this was before the exile, but uh, during the exile, the prophets, the, the, the Jewish tradition started to, to rethink it and to use the uh, I am as I am who I am and so on. Uh, in, his, in this speech, three times he contextualized the verse he quote, and he is dying. This is very important. Because our problem in the Muslim world and in the Arab world, I am Arab and I can say, in a way, I'm culturally Muslim. I belong to this culture. In our world, our problem is to interpret the Quran. And we cannot interpret it if we don't contextualize it. There is a long tradition in Islam, but not, not really very much used. We call that uh, asbab al-nuzul or asbab al-tanzil, the, 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 the conditions, the, the, the context of the revelation. Hmm? We quote it from time to time, just when it's, uh, it's good for us. Uh, and we, when not, then we forget it. Uh, it's not systematical, it's not methodological. It's simply, I am using things. Uh, and this is what, well, uh, I don't want to polemicize. Uh, um, uh, it's the fact that he is suggesting to contextualize the Bible, to say any religious document, the Quran, the Bible, the New Testament, uh, 
all of them. These are documents, literary documents written by persons. We know who or we don't know, there are anonymous or there are. Uh, these documents, as believers, I interpret them as a believer. But these documents have a context. If we don't do that, we will not understand them. Now, to my, uh, I conclude, uh, even if there are a lot of other things to add. Uh, the speaking with Islam, what he says is, one, violence is unacceptable. It does not mean we never use violence. He is not attacking someone and saying, I am pure. And he's saying, as a general rule, the same he said in, in, um, in München, in Munich, uh, sorry, in, in Köln, uh, by the gathering of the, 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 the youth hmm, to the Turkish community. He says, we all agree, you and we and us, that um, violence is unacceptable in religion. So let us build a society without violence. And uh, this is one point. The other point is any text has to, uh, from, the, from the Quran or the Bible, has to be interpreted in its context. When I am, I am weak, I act like that. When I am strong, I act another way. And this is the reality of the Quran and of the life of Muhammad. Um, today, what is our problem? What are our problems? One, everyone says in the Muslim world, uh, the viol we, we, we pretend violence has nothing to do with Islam. These um, Bin Laden and, and company, uh, these are not Muslims. Unfortunately, if we read the teaching of a lot of um, imams from Al-Azhar and from Saudi Arabia and from elsewhere in Asia, in Africa. Unfortunately, they say, uh, we have to fight because of that and that. And they quote the Quran. And they find without problem verses. And they quote the Hadith and the Sunnah. So, so um, this is our first problem. The other one, the intellectuals, say, we don't know how to, to use the Quran, how to interpret it for today. People, let us forget the problem of violence. There are one billion, uh, 300 million, I don't know exactly how much uh, Muslims today. What, are, what is their question? How to live today as Muslim in the modern time, how to, to harmonize Islam and modernity. This is our problem daily. It's almost no more the problem of Christians. It's still, but not so hard. But for us, this is our question. The answer is, could we, can we reinterpret the Quran? I was in, in July in the, in the French Senate uh, with, uh, with uh, Muhammad Arkoun, Abdel Majid Sharfi, uh, Siddiqui, and we were four for a panel about is it possible to interpret the Quran? The answer, practically, I was the only one a little bit with hope uh, because I had to. Uh, I am outsider. Uh, but the others, uh, said, uh, yeah, it's certainly, it, it could be possible, but it's so practically impossible. Here is the question, and he put the finger on this point. Uh, and the question is the relation between both. Fundamentalism uh, brings violence as we can see in 
or religions. And fundamentalism means a literal reading of the text. And here is the problem. Interpret the, the religious text, the, fun, the, the text, uh, the basic text of any religion. This is the main question. Islam is in difficulty today. What, what uh, Ratzinger says in another speech later on, Islam needs to make his enlightenment. And to go through this crisis to find a new way. My hope, in conclusion, is uh, dialogue means uh, an, a critical, love, lovely approach of the other. In the same time, if I love someone, I'm critical. If I don't love someone, I don't worry about him. He could, he could die. It's not my problem. But if it's my brother, say, I cannot leave him dying or, or uh, uh, sick. Or so so uh, Ratzinger is more clearly uh, basing everything on truth and love. Even speaking with Protestants, with other churches, with anybody, with, the, with himself, is the critical aspect, this is reason. The lovely aspect, this is brotherhood and his first um, encyclica, God is love. And we, uh, but we can never separate both. That's why the, the discussion will always be difficult because once you say you critique, people say you are aggressive against, and they not always f understand that it's out of love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hudson, some very, very stimulating um, reflections. It did leave us also some time for questions. I'd be glad to open up. Father Samir, there seems to be this sort of dilemma in Saudi Arabia in particular that, that we in the West complain that there is not the freedom for a Christian to wear a cross in public worship and so forth. But on the other hand, if, if the Saudis granted the kind of religious freedom that we're familiar with in the West, it would also open the door for uh, a lot of the more extreme a Wahhabi way of thinking. And so it's hard to know what to do there. What do you think? Yes. Um, the, uh, the source of the disease is Wahhabism. So uh, Saudi Arabia has no solution because they pretend to maintain Wahhabism and to fight terrorism. But Wahhabism is, is the seed of terrorism. It's one seed. Because Wahhabism, uh, to be clearer, uh, Wahhabism means anybody who does not think exactly as I think is heretical, is not a true Muslim. I'm speaking between Muslims and Muslims, between Sunni and Sunni, not to speak about Shia. They are Zovizo, anyhow, they are uh, uh, not Muslims not to speak about Christian, they call them Salibi. They invented this word, crusaders, the, the word we don't know in Arabic. We know fringe and so on. So the problem is deeper. Now, Wahhabism must be uh, fought. And in the other countries, we, we have the same problem. All the governors say, we are against the... The, uh, inter, uh, we are against the fanaticism and the fundamentalism and so on, and terrorism. But in fact, they cannot fight it because they want to remain on their post. 
until the fourth generation, possibly, or the, the end of the time. Uh, so they have to make every day more compromise. Compromise in, in Egypt is clear with the, we have now 88 uh, Muslim brother, brothers in the government. Our 88 our, out of 40, 100, 4, 440. That means exactly 20%. Even if the Muslim Brotherhood is forbidden. But we have to accept every time. The same in Jordan, the same in Tunisia. Only the, in Morocco and in Tunisia, they are using another uh, solution. They say this Wahhabism and fundamentalism is against our tradition, culture. This, um, this niqab, nothing to do with our Moroccan or Tunisian culture, as if it was our Egyptian culture. It's an exportation. Uh, some people export war, others export veals. We will have uh, the a speech about veal and beard and so on tomorrow. Uh, he, he will be clearer. Thanks for your wonderful lecture from which I thank you much. Uh, if my memory is correct, just now you mentioned that Buddhism is not religion according to Muslim tradition, right? Yeah, right. Uh, could you give me the further the reason why? Oh, it's very simple. Uh, in the in Islam, uh, Islam says uh, Islam came in the Middle East. In the Middle East, you have uh, pagans, let us say, having, uh, not pagans, uh, people who does not believe in God, but he believes in many, many gods. Uh, this is our, we are super religious. So the, uh, the only, those who believe in one God, this is essentially the Jews first, the Christians then, and Islam, how to justify that you come to preach um, the monotheism when you know that there are two others before you. So you say, I am the third one and the last one. I am the khatamun nabiyin, the, the seal of the prophets. So after me, no. And there are no other. This is a, a theological a prin a question of principle. It cannot be, because if you discover by chance uh, another monotheism elsewhere, then the theory of the, the closure of this movement of revelation fall down. So they have to say there is only three, and the third one is necessarily the best one. It's the... the the idea of salvation is linear. You have uh, Musa, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. Stop. And Baha'i, well, we killed them, uh, uh, for instance, or others. You cannot, the, the, uh, the Christians answer to this vision saying, no, the question is not chronological. The question is, where is the summit of the, the revelation? And they will try to say, their apology is to say, in the gospel, we arrive to the climax, to the, the, the summit of the mountain. If we go further, we go down. Uh, and the, 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 the schema is like, a, uh, it's internal. It's not a question who, so because Islam in the beginning, didn't know Hinduism, uh, uh, Buddhism, and so on. They said they are not religion. And when they speak of India, my God, they say, look at that. They, they, have, they, they adore the elephant and the monkey and the donkey. And, the, the, uh, and they, they laugh. They, there is no anthropology. This is our problem. We started in the desert where you have only man and God. 
and animals. Well, but, but not, no, really, they, this is something I feel it. Uh, being from Egypt, where I spent um, often as a Boy Scout and alone, I went in the desert. You have the feeling that there is you and God. So either you believe in God or you are an animal. They say like that. They, they say uh, non-believers are animals. Uh, well, it's, uh, in fact, this is not true. When they went to India, they included the, the Hindus and the Buddhists within the so-called Ahl al-Kitab. Um, they, uh, they developed a theory and you know that in the Quran, we have to live with other people. You can have theories, but in fact, we live together. So they developed the theory that we can live only with people be having a revelation, Jews and Christians. But then you have to have domination, and they live under your control. But honestly, this, this is fine. Now they conquest India and other countries. In some countries, in Persia, uh, they eliminate theoretically the Persian religion with the fire and so on. It, it, it's here and there. And today, it's like a geyser. It comes out. Uh, we, we notice that. When they went to India, they couldn't. This, this is a, a billion people. So they said, they have also scriptures. So they are also Ahl al-Kitab, the, the people from, from scriptures. And this is the, the lawyers, uh, this is their <laughs> job, uh, is the canonists in the Catholic Church are wonderful to solve all the problems. Any problem you can have, they find a good solution if they are clever. So Islam found a solution for other people to live with under their control. But in theory, you are nothing. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes. yeah, but at the same time, you mentioned the primitive uh, religion. A primitive religion is a religion or not? Is? Any religion has undergone the process of development. Right. Right. Uh, the, uh, again, this is not my opinion. This, this is what is usually said, that uh, the, the Moses brought a primitive... You know, if you know the, the point... If you write a thesis to prove that uh, A equal B, you use what is going in your thesis, and you leave everything else. Now, the thesis is everything converged to Islam, which is the perfection of all religions and of everything. And the Muslims are supposed to be kuntum khayru ummatin ukhrijat nas ta'muruna bil munkar. You are the best people ever um, come to the world because you you uh, you order to do the, the good and you so you know what you have to reach and you say the others are primitive because I am um, every every person will do the 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 danger for Christians is the same as for Muslim to say we are the best. The Jews prepared the, the, the way to us. We are not preparing to others. We are preaching to the world. It's also, uh, but I think that uh, I have the right to, to think it if I am not using any constriction. Or, um, it's, yeah, I. I 
I don't want to, Thank you. I'm to sure monopolize. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, while another said, I'm sure it had more questions, but uh, in the interest of time, I think we do have to close with, again, thank you very much to, to Father Thank Stanley. you. Yeah.